everyone, Richard Solomon, Taking Care of Business. Thank you for joining us this week. Today we are actually going to do something completely different. We had a meeting the other day at the, uh, the radio station. I was sitting with the station manager, Dan Cox, and having just gone through an election cycle, he said, you know, you know it would be a really nice topic to, to do, constitutional law. That's something that people really want to know more about. Now, the truth is, I don't really know a lot about constitutional law beyond sort of the very basics, you know, due process, equal protection, excessive fines. We did a show on bail once. Uh, so we reached out to, to get someone who's both like an academic and a scholar on the issues of constitutional law. And what we're going to do is kind of go back a little bit in time and go back to the old days of, uh, you know, England, the Magna Carta and things like that and actually see where our law, the origins of our law actually come from that actually became later, I guess, the Articles of Confederation, which were later you know, replaced by the United States Constitution, which is often cited but, but not necessarily always understood and, and not very well read by a lot of people. People seem to just know the folklore but not actually have ever really read it. So we're reaching out to Montgomery Blair Sibley, and uh, welcome to the show. And Richard, thank you for having me. All right. So so let's talk all about the origins of the law before we go anywhere else. Where where does where does the roots of the law come from? Where were they first established? Well, I think the idea of justice has always resonated with people. So you can go back into the old testament and even before that, if you really want to scrape into the archaeological uh, beginnings of it. But for us as uh, North Americans, we look back, of course, to the common law of England. And uh, the, the great moment, of course, was in the year 1215 when the Magna Carta was ultimately signed by, uh, by King John. Now, I, I, I didn't look this up, but I, I, I remember when I was once visiting England that there are like one or two or three copies still surviving and I remember going to, I think it was like some church somewhere, where they actually have the Magna Carta on display. And I think it's recently celebrated a big birthday. Well, yeah, 1215. It's now, uh, you know, 2015. So we do the math, that makes it up about 800 years. Wow. Uh, so what was unique about the Magna Carta? And, and why, why is it like a breakthrough document? Well, up until then, the divine right of kings had never been questioned. They were the law, they made the law, they made up whatever law they wanted to, basically. But uh, at 1215, the uh, King John, that's the King John of Robin Hood fame, uh, was so abusive in his practices that the barons, the, the major landowners, got together and basically at uh, sword point, forced him to sign a document, which became the Great Charter, and it had 63 different clauses in it, but uh, the most famous one was uh, number 39, which basically, you know, we can recognize today as being important. It said that no free man shall be seized or imprisoned or stripped of his rights of possession or deprived in any way of his rights uh, unless done so by lawful judgment of his peers and the law of the land. And so this was a bold new step forward from what had heretofore been whatever the king wanted the king got, basically. So as Mel Brooks said, it's good to be the king, but no more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. And so, uh, you know, once you plant a seed like that, that, gee, I have these rights, it's awful hard to, to take it back again. And that's kind of what happened at this point. Although, if I could footnote it for you, uh, King John never actually signed the Magna Carta, and uh, two months later, he went to Pope Innocent III and asked the Pope to issue what's called a papal bull, saying the Magna Carta was null and void. So, in fact, the Magna Carta only listed, uh, only lasted 
as a document of any legal import for uh, 60 days. Wow. Wow, not, not enough time to get it on the Internet. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't anyway. But, uh, it, it, you know, it led uh, later on to a very important um, event in, in the English history, which later became our sort of legal history, when um, Lord Coke uh, brought up the Magna Carta in the, his um, approach to uh, the king at the time, who was uh, Charles I, and his assertion of royal power. And Koch said, no, we have the Magna Carta, and there's only a limit to what you can do. And as a result, uh, Lord Koch, who by that time was 70, had been everything anybody could have been legally at that point in time, he was thrown in the Tower of London for, um, for nine months, and all his legal papers were actually seized by, uh, by the king at that time, so his uh, writings would not be known uh, publicly. Had had it in those days, how were things actually published? Because let, let, you know, when I was kidding around before about you know the Magna Carta not being around you know, long enough to be posted on the internet, how did the information in those days get disseminated? If everything was done more or less sort of by hand, it had to be hand distributed. Uh, there wasn't you know, there wasn't a central archive, I guess, uh, for a lot of things. How, how did all that work? Well, a lot of times things were read in public assemblies, like basically bars and pubs, but there was a way to copy things, and manuscripts were passed around among people, and uh, that way libraries were established, and people were able to visit libraries who were scholars and study, uh, studying this sort of thing and be able to have access to that. Uh, you know, later on, 40 years after Lord Coke died, uh, when uh, Charles I gets beheaded, under Cromwell, in fact, the reports of Cokes were published and therefore were disseminated widely. And uh, importantly, you know, of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, um, 24 of them were lawyers, and every single one of them certainly had read Lord Coke's reports, as they were called, about the history of English common law and the Magna Carta and everything else. So there's this, you know, thread that travels through time and geography here that connects us back to those barons at Runnymede and, and uh, the Magna Carta up until the people who had to come up with the solution to the social problem they had as to what kind of government are we going to create here in the United States. So let, let's go back before we, because this is, this is fascinating material. You have the Magna Carta, now, but you also talked about the common law. For, for people who are not aware, what is the common law? What was and what was its significance to the overall body of law as it began to develop? Well, you know the distinctions are hard to uh, draw really very clearly, but by and large, what the common law meant was that there was a case that was presented to a court, and the court had to come up with a rule to resolve the case. And then, when a subsequent case came up that was similar enough, the or proceeding rule was then applied in the subsequent case, and so you had a line of cases that had a consistent legal doctrine to them, and that certainty of result allowed commerce to expand, it gave people comfort knowing what would happen or not happen in any given situation, and that's the great strength of the common law. We use a Latin phrase called stare decisis, which means the thing has already been decided, and in that way, law could progress, it could adapt to new situations, but always going back to its original origins. And that was the idea of justice being, um, you know, given out through the, the uh, administration of the law. So how was the common law recorded and, and, and organized? Well, primarily it was re recorded in the reports of these court decisions, uh, these reports were kept by different people and published uh, so that as a lawyer, let's say, in the colonial America, you could read Lord Coke's reports or you could read uh, um, you know, Blackstone's reports on the English common law and the cases that came up and, and the rules of law that could be uh, divine from reading those various cases. And that's how you would go into court then and say, Judge, you know, this very similar case to something that happened in England 300 years ago, and here's what they resolved and why they did, you should apply the same results here, and that's how things advanced. 
Now, were, were there commentators on the law at some point? Well, yeah. I mean, Blackstone was one of the most famous ones, but Lord Coke uh, had it as well, and there were some others. And they would then take these cases and come up with these uh, distillations of what the, the law was or should be on a given subject. And 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 these, I guess, these covered all kinds of, I guess, everyday disputes between businesses and landowners and things like that. And you know, deer running across your property and you shooting them, and who owns the deer? That kind of thing. So yeah, right. Now, I, I know that there's a lot of Latin words in the law. I remember there's like, you know, uh, you know you are, you're a fee owner, you're seized in the land. Um, there were certain rules about, I guess, trespass. Um, how did they develop? And then were they, were they developed in, like, did, did England have different jurisdictions, different counties? And then, like, how, how did that kind of work? Well, I remember the Norman French got to invade England at one point, and, and they 10, brought all that. Wasn't that 1066? That, that, yeah. 1066, yeah. exactly. And they brought all that Latin, uh, French language and law into into the English common law at that time, and it was, you know, incorporated in. So that's why many of our phrases relate back to those uh, those times and those ideas. Okay. Uh, d- even though we have, uh, I guess, I guess, an English tradition, do our traditions have any roots in, say, France or any other countries? Well, w- there's a lot of law that's come into the United States, much like the many people who've come here. So one of the great strengths of this country, of course, is being able to adapt and absorb uh, various ideas to the general good of everyone. So we can find different kinds of uh, influences from across the bounds. But by and large, the vast majority comes out of the English common law because that's exactly where most of the people who originally came to this country and who established its political institutions, uh, that's what they were drawing from. Uh, before we leave France, did, did we ever, like, didn't Napoleon have some kind of code? I remember hearing about the Napoleonic Code. Right, and that's really the antithesis of the common law because the common law wasn't put down as a statute. The Napoleon Code actually put down as a statute almost everything that had to do with uh, human behavior. So that you didn't look to a case law, you just looked to the statute, the Napoleonic Code, and there would be your answers to whatever issue you, you had to address. So it's a different way of looking at things, and it has its benefits and, and, and uh, detractions as well. Okay. So I, I assume that the the lawyers of the day had to be sort of well-versed in all of the common law cases and the different courts. I remember, I remember hearing, you know, there's the Court of Exchequer. What was the Court of Exchequer? Well, there was always a problem that sometimes the common law rules rigidly ap- applied created injustices. And so the king set up his own court, separate from the court set up by the House of Commons, and gave them uh, authority to basically overrule the common law courts. And they were called courts of equity or courts of exchequer. And as a result, you could always petition them, if you didn't like the judgment in the common law court, to, uh, to do justice in the final analysis. And uh, in the United States here, we've merged those two courts into one court, and that merger has then given the judges a fair amount of authority and leeway to uh, see that a just result is obtained in the final analysis rather than necessarily what a particular common law or statutory law requirement is. Were there appeals back then in those days, way back when? Uh, there were. There were different levels of courts, and you could always appeal up uh, a court uh, to a different court and see if you could get a better result. So, uh, yeah, there definitely were appellate courts back then. Well, fascinating. Um, when when America was was being founded, what what did they bring with them, and and what did they reject and try to do a little differently? From the common well, law and from the common law experience. Well, that's where the, the, the Constitution really came in. Of course, we had the Declaration of Independence, which explained why we were leaving uh, the British Empire, as it were. But the, the framers of this constitutional government that we have really had to think long and hard as to what problems they had under the old system and how they could best address them under the new one. And that's where the uh, the the delegations that met to draft the Constitution uh, really had a, a very heavy task ahead of them. 
but their results were were quite spectacular and different than anybody else anything else anybody had seen before. Right, and what's kind of really cool, and I know this is sort of a side note. If you ever visit the nation's capital, Washington D.C., you could actually see the Constitution on display, and it, it's it's sort of very interesting to see what it looks like in its an original form, as opposed to eh, like a digital representation now on the internet or a little, a little brochure or something like that. And you know they're in these very special uh, cases that guard against sort of sun damage and oxidation and things like that. It's you know it's, it's well worth a trip. All right, this is Richard Salmon. The show is taking care of business. We're doing we're going back to school today. And we're, we're talking about constitutional law and the origins of constitutional law, the roots of American law and legal system. Uh, our guest is Blair Sibley, and this is the end of segment one. So stick with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Richard Solomon taking you back to school. And uh, we're learning about sort of this is like, I guess, your basic civics lesson. This is constitutional law. So welcome to Constitutional Law 101. Way back when, I think I took uh, Con Law 1 and Con Law 2 in law school. Uh, and we may have touched upon some of these topics, but uh, you know, this is like a chance for you know, a, nice, a nice sort of his historical overview. Now, during the break, I was talking to uh, our guest, uh, Mr. Mont Montgomery Blair Sibley, and he was actually uh, providing a little bit of insight as to the fact that there are drafts of the Constitution uh, also on display. Could you talk about that, please? Well, yeah, the National Archives building has the, the final Constitution, uh, you know, as, as it was ratified. But, of course, it went through many, many drafts, and there were many notations made on it. And in the U.S. Capitol building itself, they have a reception center where a, a large number of those actual drafts are out there. And so you can see Thomas Jefferson's handwriting where he says there ought to be one representative for every 30,000 um, citizens. And then it's crossed out because that never actually makes it into the Constitution. So you can see this was not a, a clean process. That you know that great quote that uh, people who love law and sausages should watch neither being made uh, was pretty <laughs> applicable here. Uh, what what was the, what was considered the breakthrough in the constitutional writing process, and what was different about the Constitution than any? prior set of law or rules in our country? Well, you got to remember, the, the men who assembled to draft this document really wanted to be there. They wanted it to work. They, they, uh, they knew that they, they had to get it right because it, if it wasn't approved by their you know, respective states, they were never going to get anything done, and they'd all be the poorer and the more defenseless as a result of it. So I think the fact that they arrived with the sense that we have to have compromise, we have to you know, address the important issues, but let's not get too many issues involved here that would be more reason for people to object to it. So uh, you know, to me, the most amazing thing is that these very diverse people, from the Southern planters to the New England um, you know, Puritans, all were able to, to work towards the common goal here uh, was, was fantastic. And and they did. They all worked. They worked. Broke up into committees. They addressed various issues. They had debates. They listened to each other, and as a result, we got that final document. And remember, that was a compromise document, only only acceptable because there was a distinct promise that when the first Congress did uh, um, convene, they would address the un. Um, addressed issues, which we ultimately came to know as the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments to the Constitution. Now, so, what was the document that preceded the Constitution? Was that the Articles of Confederation? Exactly. What What was good about that document, and what was lacking in it that required it to be replaced? Well, it just wasn't acceptable to everybody, and the federal government was just too weak to survive. I mean, those were the basic problems, and, and that's what the the uh, Constitutional Convention that came back together to address those realized. They had to give more power. They had to make sure the power was clearly defined, but not in a way that so offended the states that they would never go along with it. Where did, is this where the idea of checks and balances originated? Well, exactly so, because... Ultimately, they realized that the real question was power. 
uh, in a social compact under, you know, Locksian theory, people are giving up the natural rights they possess just by being born in order to have a social situation or, 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 or environment that they can live with and have greater good accrue to them as a result. So, you know, protection from enemies and, and, and one thing and the other. So at the, the final analysis, this contract that was being made had to be sold to the people, and they didn't want the experience they had with, you know, the King of England um, repeated in the United States. So that's where the power got diffused between our three branches of government, obviously the legislative, executive, and judicial. Talk about the different branches of government and their role in the grand scheme of things. Going back to the old days, what was the purpose of each branch and uh, – and was this was this a, like a revolutionary breakthrough in government thinking? Well, it was. Just up until then, we always had power concentrated in the hands of one executive, uh, and here they divided it into a. Uh, uh, Congress or the legislative branch, which would make the laws, and they'd be directly responsible to the people as they were to be elected every two years in the House and every six by the state legislatures for the Senate. Then there would be the executive who would uh, enforce those laws. Obviously, our president is, is elected, but he controlled a vast bureaucracy of unelected officials. And then there was the third branch of the judiciary, which would basically mediate between the two and very early on declared that it had the right to determine what was and was not the law under the, the constitutional uh, system that we had. And uh, although it's been pushed back and forth many times, it, so far that, uh, that division of power has held up fairly well and, and proved its worth. So we have our system of government in place. Did, did there was there now the sort of the fine tuning that had to take place because we're going well, from sort of theory into action? Well, exactly so. And one of the great concerns they had, if I can jump into one of my little personal passions, was the concern that what if um, what we've written isn't exactly right? How do we? You know, I'll change this massive document, this massive government that we, we've now created. And that led to the, the question of how do we amend, amend this Constitution and what process would both preserve the rights but not make the Constitution so constantly changing that it wasn't the document that uh, it needed to be, which was a very solid uh, knowing um, certainty that uh, it ultimately became. So let, let's So let's talk first about... How did the first group of amendments come about? Well, most people forget there were actually 12 amendments that were originally proposed. And it was largely because um, uh, George Mason and many others of the found, uh, framers wanted to make sure there were very clear rights that were reserved to the people, that were reserved to the states, and that the federal government was prohibited from certain actions. And so once the Constitution was pre uh passed, uh, the first Congress met, and as, by agreement, they took up those concerns that weren't originally addressed, and that's when the 12 amendments were proposed by Congress under Article 5 of their power to do so, circulated to the 13 states, and ultimately only 10 were passed, and they became our first 10 amendments that most of us know pretty well. Which, and for the people out there, what, what are the big ones amongst the first 10 amendments? Well, we all love the first, you know, freedom of press and religion, speech and assembly. Uh, many people wonder about the second, the right to bear arms. Uh, then, of course, the right to be secure in our person, papers, and effects in the fourth, and uh, the right to a due process of law uh, in the fifth, and the right to counsel in the sixth are, are the ones that most people know about. Uh, so, you know, those are some of the most significant rights known to man, and they are now memorialized in a document which is our organic law, or our highest law in the country. Right, and I also believe that the Eighth Amendment, which is freedom from excessive bail, or is it excessive bail, or just the right to bail and to be free from excessive fines? And don't forget cruel and unusual punishment, which yes. is our presidential campaign season. I've often thought we ought to be, you know, protected from that going on for 24 months as it does. <laughs> so... So we have the first ten amendments. What were the two? Do you do you know the two that didn't make it? The, the, the yeah, they had to do with apportionment and taxation, and they were just too controversial at that original uh, time. 
uh, in order to get passed by the states. So although 12 amendments were uh, proposed, only 10 uh, numbers, actually 3 through 12, were passed as what we now call our Bill of Rights, which nobody called that until the 1830s, uh, but they were just known as the first 10 amendments. Okay, there are certain things that we should probably clear up. I know that you know when you talk about the First Amendment, people say, well, you know, uh, I, th- there are limits on free speech. I think the first thing that people should be aware of is that you're allowed to criticize the government because that that's isn't that what the whole idea of the First Amendment is that you're allowed to make criticisms of the government without the government punishing you for expressing your free speech. Isn't that sort of where that comes from? That's exactly their concern is they want to be able to speak out against the government and not be uh, concerned about being uh, vilified or even you know arrested for saying those kind of things. Right now, there's there's definitely a difference between that kind of speech and then like you know opinions, opinions about private citizens, private matters, commercial matters, and that's a whole completely different body of law. Exactly, right. and you remember treason is in the Constitution as well. So there are certain statements that can be treasonous and as actionable, you know, can be treated as such. So it's not an unlimited right to speech. But there certainly is a, a broad, broad uh, spectrum of things you can say without worrying about uh, retaliation. All right. Now, when it comes to religion, is is it you're allowed freedom of religious belief, or is it that government cannot establish a religion, or is it some kind of combination of those things? Well, the the two primary. Re- uh, mentions of religion in the First Amendment are, are negative. That is, it prohibits the government from the establishment of religion or prohibits the government from um, interfering with the practice of religion. So there, there are negatives uh, on the government's a- ability to act, the limitations on the government's ability to act, I guess. Right. So and, um, Now, is that because of something that happened in Great Britain or England uh, with respect to like maybe the Anglican Church and the king being the head of the church? Well, there were uh, lots of concerns that drove many of the people out of the old world, if you will, into what became the United States, and much of that was fleeing religious persecution, which had been going on since, uh, you know, since Christ was on the cross, basically. So that was one of their great concerns, is they didn't want government in the business of religion one way or the other. Uh, now, on the other hand, you know, 53% of the people who framed this Constitution were Episcopalians, and another 20% were uh, Congregationalists. They were all basically Protestants. So they had sort of a, uh, a very similar view about religion and what they meant by it. But the freedom of religion, as that term is defined, you know, would extend to, to any uh, uh, viable religion. All right, uh, let's, let's go to freedom of the press for a second. Uh, where did that come from, and why was it so important? Well, again, it's a criticism of the government that if you put it in paper and circulate it, many people can then read it. And that ability, it's a, really a part of freedom of, of speech, is to be able to circulate ideas, ideas that may not be uh, something the government wants people to be hearing. But again, they didn't want a federal government that had that level of control. And remember, all the states can still do anything they want up to this point in time. All, only the Constitution affected was the federal government, not the state government. Of course, that's going to change when the 14th Amendment comes in after the Civil War. Well, let's talk about that. So we have the first 10 amendments. What is the next group of amendments, and why did they come about? Well, now, we, we presently have 27 amendments to the Constitution. So uh, as issues came up, Congress, in each of those 27 times, under Article 5, would propose amendments. Those amendments would then be circulated to the states in existence at that time. And if three-quarters of those states um, addressed, uh, approved those amendments, then they actually became part of the Constitution. Uh, the president, the judiciary, had nothing to do with that. It was just between Congress and the states. So the various amendments came along to address various issues as they arose. And obviously, slavery became a big one. The 14th Amendment thereafter uh, basically made the Bill of Rights and um, uh, as part of the states. Uh, as the states couldn't pass a law that violated the federal Bill of Rights. And now we have the federal Constitution overarching the entire United States and everything the states can do up to that point. Okay. So now, how many amendments? How many amendments? So we're at the Civil War. How many amendments were made after the Civil War? The time well, frame? 
from the 13th to the through the 21st amendments i guess for all that i don't have all the the dates in front of me yeah, richard yeah. i don't i can't keep that much information <laughs> in my head no it's just it's just roughly roughly now yeah it, is there a mechanism well let me ask this is there a mechanism to amend the constitution that's available to the public <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, that was the concern as they were passing it. And, and, you know, George Mason was famous for getting up and saying, if only Congress can amend the Constitution and the federal government becomes corrupt, then we're kind of in a world of problems here. So uh, upon his insistence, Article 5 came out and ultimately um, was adopted in the original Constitution that allowed two paths to amend the Constitution. One is that Congress would propose an amendment, as they have done 27 times. That proposal would be circulated to the states, and as has happened 30, uh, 30, uh, 27 times, the states, three-quarters of the states ratify that amendment, and it became part of the Constitution. Uh, one of those amendments took almost 200 years to, to get passed. But the end result was that was the first and only mode that's ever been employed. However, there is a second process which allows the states to petition or make application to Congress for a convention to propose amendments. And if uh, two-thirds of the states, which presently is 34 states, file such an application, Congress under the uh, Fifth Amendment is obligated, and it says Congress shall call a convention for that purpose. And so in that, in that scenario, uh, 34 states would apply, Congress would call a convention, the states would then assemble, and at this point, nobody knows what happens because no one bothered or had the time or inclination to put this down anywhere that's binding on anybody. So the Fifth Amendment doesn't say what happens if such a convention is called. Even the Federalist Papers don't mention it, that Alexander Hamilton largely wrote. So now we're into... Uh, uh, terra incognito, uh, a, a lay of the land we don't know anything about, uh, but it's an interesting proposition as to what would happen at such a, a constitution to propose, uh, excuse me, a convention to propose amendments. <coughs> oh, pardon me. Where, where would the actual convention physically take place? There's no answer to the question. <laughs> I mean, that's the funny thing about this, because, uh, you know, all the... Um, all the Fifth Amendment says is that uh, upon the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states, Congress shall call a convention for proposing amendments. And that's it. So, um, you know, it's up to anyone's, anyone's guess at this point in time uh, what that would mean. I think the scholarly research concludes that Congress says we're going to call a convention and it's going to be at this place and this time – and the states would then decide whether they're going to send one person on their behalf or whether they're going to send uh, a thousand people. And we look to the conventions that occurred prior to uh, the, the constitutional conventions. I mean, that is, what is the practice uh, in the 18th century? And upon all that, you come up with one state. Each state gets one vote. And if uh, 50 percent plus one of the states uh agreed to propose an amendment, that amendment would then be circulated to all 50 states for their uh, adoption or not. So who would actually vote? Would the states vote on the actual amendment, or does it get voted and then it goes to Congress? Has, I mean, draw the distinction for me. Sure. Congress's only authority under Article 5 regarding amending the Constitution is, one, to propose amendments, which they can and has, have done 27 times, and two, to call a convention when a sufficient number of states petition them. That's all their role is. They don't amend the Constitution. The states amend the Constitution. So this would be done at the state legislative level. Right. So let's have the scenario where the Congress calls the convention um, to propose amendments. At such a convention, a majority of the states propose amendments to make uh, gun ownership illegal. So now that proposal, which would be worded as an amendment, the 28th Amendment to the Constitution, would then be circulated to the legislatures of the 50 states. And if three-quarters of those legislators came, uh, legislatures came back and said, we approve that, then that would become the 28th Amendment. Uh, Congress doesn't get to make amendments. It only can propose amendments. And so the 
uh, process that any idea has to go through to actually become an amendment really makes it impossible for a fringe group to get anything sort of through the, the convention process, if you will, and radically change uh, the way our system works. So if the states were to pro- provide an amendment, then could Congress then just you know, pass some other amendment to, <laughs> to eradicate the amendment that was just proposed? But- but remember, Congress can't amend the Constitution. All they can do is propose amendments. The authority to amend the Constitution is solely a resident in the 50 United States, the states themselves. Wow. Fascinating. So, so the state of New York would then vote yes to 28, uh, um, Amendment 28, no guns allowed, or would vote yes to 28, no guns allowed. And only that way, after all 50 states had voted on this uh, mythical 28th Amendment, would uh, the Constitution officially be amended. All right. This is Richard Solomon. The show is Taking Care of Business. We're doing Civics 101. We're talking about constitutional law. This segment, in case you just missed it, was on how do you amend the Constitution? How do you convene a constitutional convention? Keep it right here. We'll be right back. Richard Solomon, Montgomery Blair Sibley, Taking Care of Business is the show. We're going back to school. We're learning a little bit about civics and the Constitution and the form of government, uh, the origins of American law. And it's kind of neat to kind of get an overall perspective of all this great history, which, which is often sort of just presumed. So let's now talk a little bit about sort of the Supreme Court. What is, what is the role of the Supreme Court of the United States? Well, they were given jurisdiction to decide a certain number of cases as the only court that could decide those cases, and primarily those are the ones that have to deal with foreign governments and their ministers and councils that are here, disputes between the states. I mean, you don't want the New York court deciding a dispute between New York and Maryland, for example, and uh, disputes between certain citizens in, in different states as well. But largely, the jurisdiction or the power of the court was left to be determined by Congress. And one of the first things Congress did when it met um, in 1789 was to uh, pass the Judiciary Act, which set out the role of Congress, uh, the role of the Supreme Court, you know, going forward from, at that point in time. Now, the original the original Supreme Court was nine justices. No, in fact, it was five. Oh, so how, so when when did it increase? Well, it increased, if my recollection's uh, correct, uh, in the 1880s, when the volume got so much higher, they decided they needed more judges to help handle the caseload, and uh, so then it was increased to nine, uh, excuse me, seven for a couple of years, then ultimately to nine, which is where it sits today. Wow. Now, just as an aside, uh, there are tours of the Supreme Court, and it's actually pretty cool, and you can actually see... I, I believe the the last time I checked, which was a long time ago, uh, you could actually sit in the gallery and watch a Supreme Court argument take place. I don't know if they still have that today, but it's 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 really nice to see the Supreme Court in action and and whatever. Is there is there like a website that this, the United States Supreme Court has where they co- talk about uh, their cases and what's going on and things like that? Well, they don't editorialize what's going on, but the cases are there. The briefs that are filed by the various parties are all available for downloading, and uh, you can certainly research the, the court's history on, on that website. So it's a very valuable resource uh, if somewhat dry. And you're right. You can take a tour of the Supreme Court. It's a fascinating, beautiful building. It wasn't built until 1933. Up until then, the Supreme Court occupied a, basically a meeting room in the Capitol building, uh, and it got so crowded that they finally talked Congress into paying for their own building, and that's what they got in 1933. Oh, wow. That's interesting. I wonder if that was a public works project. Uh, could have been. Yeah. Could have been. All right. So if, if, it, if, if you're a litigant in the federal courts, you always have one automatic appeal to what's called the circuit court, right? And, and maybe you want to talk a little bit about what's the difference between the uh, the district courts and the circuit courts. Right. So the... District courts are broken up. New York has, I guess, three or four different district courts uh, spread out across the state. 
uh, sitting above them is the Second Circuit Court of Appeal, which handles not only the cases from the New York District Courts, but also from some of the other adjourning uh, states as well, I believe Connecticut and, and Vermont. So um, those circuit courts are the courts of appeal, where if you lose at the district court or the trial court level, you always have the right to an appeal to the circuit court. Now, of course, sitting on top of all of our 11 circuit courts is the U.S. Supreme Court. And there's only a very limited number of cases that can be appealed to the Supreme Court. Everything else is on uh, what's called in Latin a writ of certiari, which is a petition requesting that the Supreme Court review a case. You don't have a right to have the Supreme Court review, review your case. Now, how many judges of the Supreme Court do you need to vote in favor of your uh, request for them to hear the case? Well, that's a great question, because I understand how this um, process works. You, Richard Solomon, have now lost a case at the Second Circuit Court of Appeal because they took your automobile, uh, claiming that uh, it was being used for illegal purposes. So you go to the Supreme Court, and you don't get to say, you must review what happened at the Circuit uh, Court of Appeals. You say, would you please review it? Here is my petition for review or my petition for certiari. The Supreme Court receives about 8,000 petitions for certiari or petitions uh, for review each year. They decide to take, or that is actually review and decide, uh, less than 100 of those. Uh, so something under 1% actually makes it to a decision process in the court. And the way they weed those 8,000 down to uh, some 80 cases that they actually are going to decide is at uh, what's called conference, which they have every Thursday at the Supreme Court during uh, the season that it sits. At the conference, the nine judges literally sit around the table, and the chief justice says, here's Richard Solomon's petition, what should we do? And they take a vote. And if four of the nine justices vote to review the case, then it will become one of the 80 that's ultimately orally argued and in a formal opinion is written on. And that's how the Supreme Court decides the, the, the few cases that it actually does decide each year. Will they group cases together? Like, in other words, let's, say, let's say there's a group of appeals that are very similar. Uh, would they pick just one? Would they pick, like, the whole group? Or it depends. Well, they have the ability, and they've certainly done that in a number of different circumstances where there were such similar fact patterns that it just made sense to uh, resolve conflicts between different circuit court of appeals by combining cases. Um, but remember, this is no longer a judicial body where they're bound by that uh, doctrine of stare decisis or decided cases before. This is really a super legislature. Because, uh, you know, a regular court, it's much like a baseball umpire, Richard. When the ball crosses the plate, he either calls it strike or a ball. And once it crosses the plate, if he refuses to do either, well, the game absolutely stops. You can't proceed anymore. And that's what uh, you go to a court, you're going to get a decision for or against you. You go to the appeal, you're going to get a decision for or against you. You go to the Supreme Court, they get to decide whether or not you get an opinion. And that by that way, they have a tremendous influence on shaping the direction of law. So, for example, if your case where your car was seized because it was being used for legal purposes, uh, they don't want to decide that case because it would send the law in a direction they politically don't want it to go, then, of course, uh, you're not going to get heard, and they become a legislature deciding whether or not to pass laws rather than actually determining what the law is. All right, so in that, in that circumstance, when they, when they deny a request for appeal, I is, is that sort of like, a quiet way of saying, we're leaving everything the way it is, so you're just stuck with the last result. That's exactly what it is. And that's not what a court should be doing. A court should be saying, here are your facts, here is the existing law, and therefore you're entitled to this result. And right. now, that's but, what the Supreme Court doesn't do anymore. Right. Now, in the regular world of appeals and regular cases and things like that, how many appeals do you normally get before – you max out. Is it? Is it? You normally get just one appeal, and then everything else after that's discretionary. That's exactly the way it is. Almost nationwide, in not only the federal system but the state court systems as well. Right. So you get your trial, you get one appeal, and then after that, you may or may not get another appeal. Uh, you get. It's not really an appeal, but yes, exactly. So, well, or I guess it's further review. 
Exactly. Uh, and I guess it's because the, the, we just can't appeal things forever and ever. But but what's interesting is at least in some situations, you can go from administrative courts and then sort of have a more traditional court review the administrative decision, and then you get a, a, an appeal from there. So in some ways, that appellate process is actually quite lengthy. It can be, and it can take years and, and obviously lots and lots of money to keep it going for, for many people. Right. Now, just fr from, from a nuts and bolts point of view, what kind of paperwork is actually involved in an appeal? How, how do you put together the record and how do you do you do you just say, well, look, this is what's wrong, and you have to just narrow it down to a laser focus, or I mean, how does that all work? Well, basically, if you're thinking it through, you're preparing your appeal before you start the lawsuit or respond to the lawsuit that's been filed against you or your client, because the law doesn't really reflect reality. It reflects what's put forth as reality through the laws of evidence into the trial record. And it's that record that's carried up to the to the court of appeals or the appellate court, if you will. So in the record, if it's shown that your car is, is red, but in fact it's blue, on the appeal, you can't say, oh, in fact, my car is blue, because the record's going to show it's red, and that's all the judges will consider, that it was a red car. So it, it really is a very complicated process to establish an appeal by making sure the record below is actually accurate as to what, what happened uh, to cause the issue to begin with. Now, there's an appellate record, and there's briefs. How, how does all that stuff work? So literally, the uh, transcripts of the proceedings, the, the various pleadings that were filed, they're all um, bound into one large volume and shipped up to the court. Then the person who's making the appeal files a, a brief, usually less than 50 pages, arguing what the case was about, what the law is or should be, and what result needs to be uh, ultimately determined. The other side gets to file their response. But generally, the person who files the appeal gets to file a shorter reply brief, and then there's oral argument, and then you wait around six months to a year for the appellate court to come up with an answer. Now, in some places, there's all, there is oral argument. Um, I, I could just share that in the second department. Uh, it's a very interesting experience because uh, when you go to the second department, which is in Brooklyn, and that covers a certain part of uh, New York City's jurisdiction, uh, the, the, the court really had, I, I tell you, it's, it's kind of an amazing experience. Uh, it's, a quiet, it's a very quiet court. There's usually not a lot of people from the general public there. It's usually just a, a room full of lawyers all waiting for about 10 minutes of potential argument time. And a lot of times uh, they, you, you can tell that they, the court has read all of the papers. It's very unusual because um, – that's not always the experience. A lot of times when you go to regular court, uh, when they conference cases or they sit down with you, they'll say, what is this case about? And then it's soundbite time. Well, it's about this, it's about that, or you know, it's a contract or blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, this is a vendor-vendee relationship, something like that. Here, they've really read the paperwork, and, and you get some very, very focused questions that they just hit you with. And they really look to see how you respond. Um, I remember I had an appeal that I was defending. So what is the other party was the aggrieved party. So they brought the appeal. And I remember they asked the other side just one, one initial question, which was, and it really kind of gave away what their thinking was. They said, are you appealing uh, from the summary judgment of the denial of this dollar amount, that dollar amount, or that dollar amount. And the guy was just flabbergasted. And then they looked at me and they're like, you don't need to say anything. I'm like, okay, fine by me. And <laughs> because no one to shut up is important. <laughs> you know, uh, I know that you're supposed to reserve like 15 minutes through protocol. You then tell them you only need 10. And then from there, you just take as little time as you need. But, but they're very focused. They, they really don't waste time on collateral issues, nuances. They get right to the heart of the matter. And I, and I always thought that that was what was very nice about the appellate process. What, what's expensive about the appellate process is the massive amount of paper and briefs and uh, appellate printing costs. 
uh, I think you need you know multiple copies, you need one for every judge, you need extras, you need file copies, and things like that. And that could be uh, quite expensive uh, for the litigants to bear. Even even in this age of electronics, there's still a lot of paper. Uh, well, let's go back to the Supreme Court. They require that your uh, your petition, if you will, be filed in a booklet that's six inches by nine inches in size. Now, the rest of the world operates on eight and a half by 11 inch paper. Well, you know, every court in the United States operates on that except the Supreme Court. So now you have to find a printer who can print your, your argument, your brief, if you will, on this special booklet form in a special type. And it just makes it even more difficult to, to actually file something up there. Uh, is there electronic filing in the United States Supreme Court as of today? No, not, not as, as of wow. today. You still have to file your 40 copies of your petition in a six by nine inch booklet, or the clerk will send it back to you. Wow. Uh, now, I assume there are companies that are poised for this? That do this yeah, I, I, I get quotes that range between uh, eight and $10,000 to print those 40 booklets. I take it to my clicky print down here and get them done for about $300. <laughs> but it took a while for me to train my printer over there how to get this done properly. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's just a remarkable system. And there's a limit on the pages that you could submit? They only want Sure. It? So I guess, so as, as a person who writes appeals, I guess you have to figure out what are the super issues and how to just argue them very effectively, very efficiently. Yeah, you've got to strike a chord in the political uh, agenda of the justices in order to get their attention and take the case forward. You know, the fact that you're right has nothing to do with it. It's whether their political agenda is going to be advanced by your case and what they think is important. And that's sort of the horse trading that goes on at the Supreme Court among the justices. And there are a number of great books written by uh, some of the clerks of those justices about what, what goes on there and uh, how they trade this for that in order to get what they want uh, going forward. No, so, so basically what you're trying to, I guess, say is that at the Supreme Court level, even though your case is important to you, they look more as the case as being symbolic of something just so much broader than the actual litigants in that case. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. Well, that was the fastest radio ever. Uh, <laughs> so I, I would like to thank my guest, uh, Blair, Montgomery Blair Sibley, uh, for sharing his uh, knowledge and wisdom about uh, the Supreme Court. Now, you, before we go, you, you were going to share a little story about uh, some, somebody from your family? Well, just very briefly, in the 1930s, Roosevelt, the FDR, was terribly frustrated by the court, which kept overturning his New Deal policies. So he thought, well, what if we add four more justices to the Supreme Court that I can appoint? So we'll have uh, 13 justices on the Supreme Court. But before he went to that trouble, he wanted to find out if any of the uh, justices sitting on the court were going to retire shortly, in which case he could appoint their, their uh, successors who would be sympathetic to Roosevelt's uh, agenda. So my grandmother, who at the time was with her husband, my grandfather, uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, happened to be great friends of Eleanor Roosevelt. So Eleanor called her one day and said uh, to my grandmother, Georgiana Sibley, would you go visit the wives of all the sitting Supreme Court justices and see if any of them are going to retire? So over the course of a week or two, which was the custom back then, she went around to the house and she presented her card and then they'd have tea and she'd sit and inquire about the health of the husband of the, of the, uh, who was the Supreme Court justice and ultimately filtered back a report that none of them were going to retire as long as FDR was still breathing. So upon that, uh, he moved forward with this pact, the Supreme Court uh, agenda, which ultimately cowed this, the nine sitting justices and to start approving his agenda. And uh, the New Deal then marched forward. So uh, my grandmother used to tell a great story about inquiring gently as to the health of these sitting Supreme Court justices uh, on behalf of Eleanor and ultimately FDR. Wow, that's a great behind-the-scenes story. Yeah. And, and we are out of time. So thank you for listening. We'll see you next week on Taking Care of Business. My very special thanks to Montgomery Blair Sibley for spending his valuable time with us today. See you next week. Mm-hmm.